speaking with Rob Garf, VP of uh, Industry Strategy and Insight Insights at uh, Salesforce Commerce Cloud, formerly known as Demandware. How are you, Rob? I'm great. Thanks for having me here today, Darius. Thank you for your time. Uh, so I want to start by asking, how is the uh, integration of Demandware into Salesforce going? And then into what are the new things that Demandware is actually able to do with the customers or the commerce cloud now, you know, having the umbrella and the power of Salesforce around it. Sure, yeah, good question. Yeah, let me take those in, in pieces. You know, when you think about uh, Demandware coming on the scene in 2004, really disrupting the market, offering a fundamentally different model to manage your e-commerce platform in the cloud, uh, we made great traction, obviously moved upstream, helping some of the largest retailers in the world. And uh, in a parallel path, you had Salesforce in 1999, really pioneering cloud, bringing social mobile to enterprise. Um, and they grew really out of, uh, or I should, I guess, say now we grew out of the uh, Salesforce automation space to the broader CRM. And one piece of which was missing prior to the acquisition of Demandware was that commerce experience. So they provided a platform to help attract new customers through marketing cloud and certainly service and sell to and provide communities various other clouds but bringing together commerce cloud as part of the uh, intelligent customer success platform really allows salesforce now to provide a relevant really these personalized one-to-one -one journeys across the entire shopping experience so i'm personally excited to be part of the team and uh, certainly what we have to provide to the the broader b2c and retail market okay so is is Commerce Cloud being sold right now as a separate product or as a part of the Salesforce uh, experience? Sure, yeah, no, that's a logical question. It's um, a separate product, so Salesforce Commerce Cloud is still really at its core the digital commerce platform. Of course, we've moved aggressively into the store and now offer Salesforce Commerce Cloud Store, and layered underneath that is Commerce Einstein. So as with really this being the year of Einstein for Salesforce, we are infusing artificial intelligence into Commerce Cloud to help our customers provide a personalized, really, as I mentioned before, a one-to-one right. -one relationship with that customer. So I heard about Einstein, and actually I wanted to learn more about it. Can you talk about Einstein at all? Or? Yeah, absolutely. So broadly speaking with Salesforce, Einstein is bringing artificial intelligence to the enterprise. And rather than companies individually having to employ an army of data scientists, it's like having an army of data scientists baked right into the platform. And it's not just about coming up with good decisions, but it's also executing and efficiently executing on those intelligent decisions. So in the context of Commerce Cloud, um, we've actually had these capabilities for the better part of three years. Last year, we introduced product recommendations, which we now call Einstein product recommendations. We have about 250 sites live, and our customers are seeing anywhere from a 7 to 16% uplift just by virtue of a more personalized experience. Later this That's year... 7 to 16% more in conversion? In uh, revenue. revenue, yeah. Revenue? It's, it's okay. pretty quite amazing, the uh, uplift people are seeing. And the other aspect to that is we are continually putting this innovation into the platform. And so this year, we will introduce Commerce Insights, really a dashboard to make smarter decisions around merchandising and predictive sort as well, to really be able to personalize uh, the navigation, whether it's digitally or in the physical world through Commerce Cloud. So, so this is all possible without somebody even using Salesforce? Well, this is all possible without using other aspects of the Salesforce. Other aspects of the Salesforce. Yeah, exactly. Right. So we are part of, and it's a good line of question, right. you know, we are part of, now that Salesforce obviously has a very broad portfolio of capabilities, so it's, right. clear, it's important to be clear here um, that we are part of the intelligent customer success platform that includes marketing cloud, service cloud, sales cloud, IoT cloud, community cloud, and also the development platform, right. but um, we are sold and maintained independently. You don't have to have those other components, and the Einstein capabilities are also specific to Commerce Cloud. Commerce Cloud, okay. So, I mean, it, it definitely 
if you are in retail, if you're doing anything, selling anything, you need to have a CRM aspect to your business. That's right. So I think the, the value here is that if you have this, you already have a tight integration between Salesforce.com or maybe Desk.com and Commerce Cloud. Yeah, so it's interesting. You know, when um, we were acquired, uh, there were two things that were clear. The first one was don't mess up your current business. You have many happy customers who are growing two times the industry average, and they expect innovation. And as a company before the acquisition demand, where, and certainly Salesforce, it's all about customer success, right? So it's continually innovating and in bringing product to market to support the um, changing consumer needs. The second aspect, and Darius, where you're going with this is, there's a great opportunity here to provide a creative value by bringing together the various clouds to solve specific use cases. So many of our clients are doing that today, whether it's Suit Supply as an example, who are using various clouds within the intelligent customer success platform to provide a personal experience both in store, uh, but also in line, online. And so we're gonna harden that over time and look for where those cases are, where we can combine these clouds uh, so that our clients can get the creative value from us. Right, so traditionally, Salesforce, uh, the, the CRM site, is really designed for B2B. So there has to be some modification on how to use that actually for B2C, but it's not a major like you know, change. It's still you're, you're helping customers, you're helping consumers, but there's gotta be a little bit of a change in actually addressing consumer side. Well, yeah, so first of all, yeah, as you know, because you know the space really well, Darius, uh, Salesforce is the number one CRM platform, the fastest growing enterprise software company to reach $8 billion in revenue. And so certainly they cut their teeth. I should say we cut our teeth right. in the CRM space and continue to leave that market. Um, for the retail space, um, that means really putting the customer at the center of everything that we do and our customers do, the retailers, right? And that also entails having a single version of the customer and right. a single view of who that customer is, whether they're shopping online, they're shopping via messaging platform, social platform, in store. And so there's a huge opportunity here for Salesforce to have that single view of the consumer, of the shopper, that would then, with Einstein layered on top of all of that data, whether it's data being generated generated within the platform or data generated outside the platform to layer on top artificial intelligence to provide that personalized experience. So it's great, great opportunity here for our customers to succeed. Right. So what, what are you finding as far as on the technological side of commerce? Things that are changing, you know, like right now the, 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 the API model mm -hmm. of integration and actually providing what's called microservices. Sure. Uh, is that something that uh, Commerce Cloud is looking into? Yeah, so I, let me, I'll address that directly, but if I step back a little bit, there's a ton of disruption happening on the technical side of commerce, of retail in general, right? And so we're seeing it on mobile, where according to our shopping index, which looks at about 440 unique shoppers on the platform in, on a monthly basis, more than 50% of traffic is now in mobile, about 30% of orders are mobile. And some customers of ours over the holiday, 75% uh, of the traffic and sales were on mobile. So there's a seismic shift to that. Mobility doesn't only transcend to consumers, but also the store associates. So really shifting from the checkout process to the check-in process and being able to influence the consumer when they're in the discovery and research versus the checkout process. Right. That's one aspect of technology. The other one that I'll mention, and I have already actually, is artificial intelligence. So being able to really get very predictive around what the consumer will react to and what their next ex best action should be. The last piece that I'll mention, and there are so many more, but I will say this is um, voice. I see voice as being one of the next user interfaces for shopping. It's so natural, it's so intuitive, and it's for everybody. And so being able to use that, whether it's Alexa or another IOT type of device to be able to interact with um, in a more natural way. Right, so voice makes it really interesting. 
you know, providing CRM services, customer service via voice would be a dream. Sure. If I can just say, if I could say something to Siri and it, you know, she or it actually would understand it really good and uh, provide it, I, I think it's like a, it's an amazing experience for the consumer. So that's right. I mean, you, people even um, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. So how do you how do you actually implement that within the customer service side? Is yeah. So like you know, like Alexa, for example, and I mean there are other platforms. They have ways for other co companies to mm -hmm. build skills. That's right. Is would that be a way to actually? So I'm thinking like would would Salesforce, for example, partner with this is hypothetical completely, but would Salesforce go and create skills for Alexa? Yeah, so I'm not going to speak directly to that, right. but I will. The concept is is right on. And, and so let me give you two examples here, right? And so while I'm in the commerce cloud, I spend a lot of time with my colleagues. And if I think about the service cloud and what they're doing and creating more of conversational service. So if you step back, customers are in control, right? They have more access, they have more leverage, they have more influence than ever before. And so they want to interact with retailers and their brands in the context of their lives versus, versus in the context of the retailers' lives. So it's whether it's in messaging platforms, social media, wherever the case might be. And our service cloud is actually embedding service right in those various messaging platforms. You can only imagine um, a world in the not too distant future where that can be done via voice. Um, but what I also will say is General Motors, outside of the traditional retail space, is moving from just an automotive company to a total transportation experience company. And uh, they are, um, and I would put this in the IoT and voice category, really making their cars a lot smarter and allowing consumers to interact with the car, whether that means, again, hypothetically, um, being able to find out via voice where the closest uh, Dunkin Donuts is and then who knows Dunkin Donuts could offer up a promotion if in fact the consumer actually ends up going one you know point one miles out of the way to be able to get that that big cup of coffee yeah I, the sky is the limit really as it really is as far as what you can do the question is how far how, how much are consumers actually going to take without get, getting freaked out Sure, of course. Yeah, so, no, there is, of course, a balance there. Yeah. Uh, when I think about Salesforce, trust is our number one value. So, of course, uh, that means trust in our reliability, our security, our scalability. But um, certainly there's an aspect of trust that consumers have right. with the retailers they deal with. Right. Okay. So, you mentioned uh, mobile, AI, and voice as the three factors of disruption. What do you think about video? Live video. Sure. Oh, well, live video, of course, but also if you see how consumers in general are consuming, I guess, I, yeah, right. whatever, uh, are using or interacting with the social uh, aspects of their lives, it, many of it is in video. And so I can see that within retail really transcending um, and creating, for instance, shoppable videos. And right. so, again, anything retailers can do to break down the friction between inspiration and purchase is a good thing. And it goes back to that point, being able to be embedded in the daily lives of the consumers so that it doesn't become this discrete event for shopping, but rather it's just naturally done without extra steps to make it happen. And when we think about, you go back to the microservices comment, which I didn't forget about, uh, that you asked about a little while ago. Certainly as we look about developing our platform, we want to allow retailers to embed commerce wherever the consumers are. And that is done most efficiently through microservices. Right. Yeah, it's a lot easier to actually bring in other services these days than it was even five years ago. That's right. So now um, you mentioned, uh, so on, on the concept of Einstein. Mm -hmm. So of course, when you think about, you know, AI, Watson comes on you know everybody's mind it has a name recognition and it's been playing chess for a long time and now it's getting into retail what is the difference what what are what would be the differentiators between Einstein and Watson and this is like I love the naming <laughs> <laughs> yeah right exactly you know I you know I defer uh, to some public information that we provided on the topic to go in deep details but what I can say is um, 
Einstein and Watson provide artificial intelligence capabilities, but in slightly or many different ways. There's no real overlap in the capabilities they provide. The way the uh, part of the relationship is structured in that Einstein will consume information and data, like as an example, the Weather Channel information that IBM purchased a couple of years ago, to help really infuse that into Einstein to make it smarter. Einstein, as our, in the Commerce Cloud chief data scientist talks about, is thirsty for data. Okay. And anything we can consume, um, and much of that in the future will be from external data sources, whether it's generated from IoT, voice, or third-party systems, to make Einstein smarter to then translate into more personalized one-to-one -one journeys is a good thing. Right. Okay. So you think it's uh, it could be actually complementary to each other, helping each other. Their, their relationship is designed to be extremely complementary. We feel like there's uh, very little to no overlap in the portfolio between Einstein and Watson. And uh, it's two great companies coming together and doing some good stuff on behalf of our customers. Right, so are there going to be, again, as much as you can say, are there going to be any like examples of Einstein and uh, Watson implemented with the same retailer anytime that we can probably foresee in the future? What I will say is stay tuned on that. Stay tuned, okay, awesome. That's uh, <laughs> as good an answer I can <laughs> You had to try, that's, that's fair, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I know that you mentioned also this shopper index. That's right, yes. What is this? Is this is a, like a report that... Uh, it is, yeah, so, uh, yeah, thanks for asking about that. So part of my team's charter is, well, if you step back, again, you know, we're a cloud platform. So all the data that's generated on our platform um, is available in aggregate in a secure manner to us to view, right? So we can, on, an, on what we do on an ongoing basis, is aggregate and then analyze that data and really becomes the de facto of digital shopping trends month over month, year over year. And of course, we can slice and dice that by geography, by size, by type of retailer and get some great insights. So my team on an ongoing basis, actually a quarterly basis, looks at the shopping index for that. Okay, and then, so what is, uh, so is it done, uh, like the la latest one was released when? Just uh, a week or two ago, and it looked at the last quarter. The last quarter of 2016? That's right, and all year as well, but primarily last quarter of 2016. Okay, so um, anything of like, standing out for you in that quarter? Yeah, so I would say two things, um, and I wouldn't say this is new, but the, the surge of mobile. It's really become a mobile first world that we live in. And uh, you know what we found is the conversions are ticking up. We find that uh, customers, retailers in general, are doing a better job breaking down the friction, particularly in the checkout process. Uh, you can attribute a bit of that to Apple Pay. If you think about trying to type in your address, billing information, and credit card. It's just not fun, right? right? So being able to create a seamless transaction, a frictionless transaction is one piece. The second piece is uh, we look at uh, source of traffic uh, across all of our clients, and what we saw is a, a nice uptick in uh, social as the driver. And so we do see social, going back to the point around distributed commerce or where, you know, having retailers be where the consumers are as a big important shift in, uh, you know, again, it's not just about pulling, having retailers pull consumers to their property, but it's about having retailers also push their brand to wherever the consumers are. Right. We think that uptick in social activity uh, is a manifestation or a proof point around that. Okay, so one of the things that people were really excited about was like when Facebook allowed companies, retailers to have their own page and actually purchase things on Facebook, but I don't think that it really caught on as much as they, people expected. Mm -hmm. It seems like people are still driving, I mean, the best insurance that you can have against a competition as a retailer is to get as much direct contact with the shopper as possible. Sure, yeah, that's, is that, and well, yeah, I mean, that is kind of the conventional thinking, and right. retailers love that because it puts them in control of the shopping experience and their brand, but the reality is um, that's not what consumers are wholeheartedly um, demanding these days, and I think the best thing to do is look in other geographies, so you look at China as an example, and WeChat, 
right? right? So WeChat, huge messaging platform. Many of the customers have um, direct linkages into bank accounts and banking information. And so many retailers uh, to really thrive in that area are embedding their products in WeChat. So Lacoste is a good example right. where they're not relying on a consumer to punch out of WeChat and go through the shopping experience that way, but rather ask questions of their social network, um, query them on what they like, what they don't like, and then be able to purchase right in app without leaving. So um, is it going to happen overnight? No, but is are we seeing a shift to this distributed or off-property type of commerce that's happening? Yes, absolutely. And again, it's still such a small, of all of right. retail, such a small percentage, but growing. Right. So so that's the other, I guess, you know, interesting thing that I, I, I see is that the, the overall size of retail is so massive, trillions mm -hmm. of dollars. Mm -hmm. And then these new technologies are actually changing, but they're pace of change is not only fast, it actually seems like it's picking up. Yes. So it's still a small piece of the pie, but it is starting to get bigger and bigger and bigger. That's right. So, uh, you know, I guess one question for any retailer is that, um, where do I invest in right now? If, I, if I'm a local, you know, business, yeah. I have five stores in the LA area, for example. Yeah. Where should I invest my money? Yeah. So I'm going to take this from two different angles. Um, one is a little off from your direct question, then I'm going to come back and answer sure. your question directly, sure. if that's okay. First of all, I'd invest in the organization. Um, we just did some research with Accenture that looked at, based on these disruptions, what does the new retail enterprise need to look like in the future? And the findings are fascinating in that um, whereas in the past when retailers were product centric it was all about throughput it was all about efficiency it was all about quality it was all about owning and operating everything yourself in this new world that we've been describing over the last couple of minutes it's not going to work that way retailers need to be a lot more networked they need to be a lot more open they need to be a lot more collaborative and that means in many cases outside of your four walls in fact somebody we interviewed as part of the process mark west as part of the ceo of llx gbs they operate jimmy chu bell staff and bally's he said you know in the future his organization is going to be a lot more distributed a lot more networked not everything needs to be within his own four wall one thing he does know is that they'll still own the customer own the customer experience, they'll be a steward on behalf of the customer. And so, I, you know, there's a lot more detail in this research, but what it tells me is the DNA, the fabric of a retail organization is going to look a lot different. So uh, if I'm a retailer, five stores, large, or whatever the case might be, I look at how you can take some of these characteristics that we learned through the research, whether it's agility, whether it's data intelligence, whether it's market insight, culture, and think about how you look and operate a lot differently. So that's my soapbox and now i'll go back to your direct okay. question in terms of what i would invest in um, and i would look at it this way i would acknowledge that the shopper in many cases is starting the shopping experience um, online digitally in most cases in mobile and though they're consummating or finalizing that transaction in the store right so what i would do is i would focus on artificial intelligence to a know who that consumer is at each stage of the journey Second, be able to collect data around the digital footprint that they are leaving across this journey. And then lastly, personalize that interaction in the context of where they are and what problem they're trying to solve. But it does the wrapper, the theme there is artificial intelligence. Okay. So that's where I, I actually would like to have another interview just specifically talking about Einstein yep. and the artificial intelligence files. Because, I mean, this is like when you say use artificial yeah. intelligence to know the customer better. Yeah. How? Yeah. And that's, that's fair, you know, and I, it yeah. may be it's a misnomer in that, right? Artificial intelligence is the technology and the practice to get there. But at the end of the day, to me, to what we see across our client base is, and what my advice would be to this five-store chain looking to grow, 
is personalization. And so that's the business outcome of personalizing and providing a relevant experience. The way to get there is through. But so that's a tool. Talk, that's yeah, a tool that's they the need tool. to use. If so they don't talk use it, that. then it's just going to make it a lot more difficult. Yeah, yeah why don't we so do that we'll, and highlight a couple of customers who are doing awesome jobs. Yeah, we'll do that. that later. Okay. So yeah. one last question. International reach. Yes. What is... Uh, Salesforce Commerce Cloud's footprint right now as far as cross-border commerce, sure. things like that. Sure, yeah. You know, when we started, again, in 2004, we targeted uh, vertically integrated manufacturers, those that hadn't sold online before. And um, we've obviously grown since and sold successfully and supported successfully um, other types of retailers. But one of the business problems they were solving at the very beginning was going international digitally without having to put a whole footprint in the physical uh, store. And so that's been a core competency of ours. Actually, our customers operate digital, digitally in more than 50 countries around the world. We have headquarters around the world as well. But that's a huge value of the cloud, if you think about it. You're able to expand internationally without having to stand up hardware, software, infrastructure, and all these local entities. And the way we are architected allows very effectively and efficiently to stand up stores in like weeks, not months, certainly not years. Okay. So the short answer is we have a nice international reach right. organically as an organization, but our customers are operating on the commerce cloud platform around the world. And does that include China? That includes China as well. Yeah, okay. and you know, it's uh, typically a dual strategy for retailers that are looking to grow their footprint in China. What I mean by that is they're using the T-Malls of the world and WeChats of the world, but also want a branded site. You know, not much different than early on here in the U.S. in terms of uh, trying to feel out different ways to reach the customer, but ultimately bring them to their own property. Also looking at other marketplaces in the U.S. That's right, as, sure. As an option. Okay. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Rob. I'm excited to see what Commerce Cloud is doing. Thanks a lot for your time. Really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you.